In the book of John, chapter number 10, in verse number 10, we find our foundational verse of scripture for this series. Very familiar verse of scripture, and it reads, The thief comes not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And Jesus said, But I have come that you might have life, and that you might have it more abundantly. In church, I'm teaching from the life-changing, life-blessing, and life-building series entitled True Prosperity in Tough Times. Can you say that with me? True Prosperity in Tough Times. Amen. Well, this is division number two, and this is lesson number five. Now, this is the last lesson in this division. All right, so after this, next week we're going to go into a new division, which is kind of going to have a new emphasis. And if you've noticed in this division, the emphasis, at least as we're ending up, has really been to the heart of this thing of, of how we can prosper all uh, materially, even in tough times. Last couple of weeks, boy, if you missed the last couple of weeks, you really need to go online and listen to it because I really dealt with the hard issue of how do you uh, not suffer any lack in hard economic times? And folk running around here trying to get the answer, and I gave you the answer over the last couple of weeks, and we're going to see more of it tonight. Uh, first of all, let's have our review. Now, in Division 1, we said that there were four levels of prosperity, right? Somebody say, this is a part of the answer. This is a part of the answer. In other words, the first level is spiritual, the second level is mental, the third level is physical, and the last level is material, right? Mm -hmm. And you know that when Pastor gives a quiz later on this year, you know, I was thinking, I might not even wait to the end of the year to give a <laughs> quiz about this stuff. Because we, but when I do give a quiz, this <laughs> car is laughing. When I do give a quiz, you know this is going to be on the quiz, right? right? The four levels of prosperity. All right, because prosperity is first spiritual. And then we said spiritual prosperity is defined First of all, by saving grace, and then by great grace, right? Spiritual prosperity, first of all, has got to be saving grace, which, which is what the grace that we need to get saved, right? How's everybody feeling temperature-wise? Anybody need any heat, or is everybody okay? Everybody's fine? That's fine. Fine is fine. All right, so first of all, spiritual prosperity, we need saving grace. And then that's going to be followed by great grace. In essence, I just restated what Jesus said when he said, I came that you might have life and have life more abundantly. Somebody say saving grace, saving and, grace. Grace. and greater grace. And greater grace. Yeah, that's, that's really what he was saying. You need to get in Christ and then you need to abound in the things of Christ by grace. Now, we said that, uh, that in Division 2, that this great grace or greater grace gives us the privilege an opportunity to be led by the Spirit into perfect position every time. Now that's, that's what that great grace does. Once we're in Christ, we live and we move and we have our being in Him, and that great grace helps us to be led every day to where we're supposed to be exactly and perfectly. Amen? Amen. That sounds like that prayer, right? That God would lead us exactly where we're supposed to be doing exactly what we're supposed to be doing uh, and, and, and meeting exactly who we're supposed to be meeting at every point in the day. Amen? And that's because of the great grace that comes by the leading of God's Spirit. So then we talked about the fact that the most successful place to be is in the will of God, right? The most successful place to be is in the will of God. In other words, uh, we have to be in position. And when we're in position spiritually, we will be in position naturally. So this lines up with the four levels of prosperity. In other words, when we're in position, when we have, uh, when we have spiritual prosperity, it's only, it's only going to follow that we're going to have material prosperity. It's just that we don't chase material prosperity. We chase spiritual prosperity. Amen? Amen. You know, all of this could be wrapped up into that one very well-known scripture, Matthew 6.33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Now that's spiritual prosperity. See? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. In other words, letting us know that the only problem we really have in life, the only problem we really have in life is sin. 
That's it. That's the only problem we really have in life. Now, now, we have been forgiven of our sins as it relates to saving grace. But, but even after that, we can sin. So what we want to do is want to live this abundant life without sin. Amen? We don't want to be... We don't want to be living in sin. In other words, we don't want to have a pattern of sin, right? We might fall short here and there and, and think a thought we shouldn't think and say a word we shouldn't think. But for the most part, we want to be living and moving and having our being in righteousness. Amen? Amen? Amen. Not sin. After we're born again, born of the Spirit, and filled with the Spirit, and daily refilled with the Spirit, we're not going to be... In. I like how the, the Bible says it. It says those that are born of God don't sin. All right, listen to me. The Bible says it like this. I believe it's 1 John. It says, those that are born of God don't sin. That's right. How does that translate? Those that are born of God don't practice sin. Right. Y'all with me? Yeah. See, once you, once you really, once you really are, are, are filled and are, are yielded to the leading of God's Spirit, you don't practice sin. Like the song said on Sunday, I'm changed. Amen? you changed. Anybody, do I have any changed folk here? Amen. You, you, you changed. And then you don't live a life of sin anymore. Now, uh, in lesson number four, last week, that was last week, right? Last week in lesson number four, uh, actually, I'm going to put three in, excuse me. No, this week is lesson number five, right? So I'm going to put three and four together. Last couple of weeks in lesson three and four, we were talking about the most successful place to be in tough economic times is in the will of God. And what we said is that God is the source and he'll use any resource that he wants to use, right? And we saw this demonstrated with the prophet who? Elijah. Remember that? With Elijah, God showed us that, look, I'm the source and I can, I can direct you by my spirit to any resource I want. If the brook dries up, I'll tell you where another brook is or might not use a brook this time. But basically what we saw with Elijah is God, we saw this word providence, where God has already provided the next resource for you. Somebody say, it's already provided. It's already provided. Say, it's already all right. It's already all right. Yeah, so, so when you, you, you seem to be, we seem to panic, thinking, oh Lord, the brook dried up, but, he's, but God is saying, hey, I already commanded a widow woman to provide for you. Now, how does this relate to us? God is trying to tell us that when natural resources dry up, he needs us to network with the body. Did y'all hear me? Yes. God needs us to network with the body. It's, it, it, that's why this, this thing about coming together in the local church is so important because the resources and the inf resources aren't always things. Sometimes they're just informational. But the resources that we need are in the body. Say, say what we need, what we need is, in this local body. is in this local body. I'm looking at some people in the church right now and I'm watching how connections are being made. And it's pretty amazing. It's, it's wonderful. Because informationally, uh, people are exchanging information and before you know it, it's like, wow, that was just what I needed to, to know. That was just where I needed to go. That was just what I needed to do. And it's right within the body. So the widow woman is a type of a member of the body of Christ. And God connected Elijah with her. Then last week, moving out in faith, we, we went from Elijah to uh, the time of Elisha, his successor, and these four lepers. Anybody remember the four lepers? Mm -hmm. The four lepers who were outside of the city gate of Samaria. Remember that? And we said that they, the most successful place to be was in the will of God. And that we learned from them that we must allow God to lead us to uh, very unlikely places. To seemingly unlikely places. In other words, in a time of famine, God will lead you to a seemingly unlikely place. Let me give you an example. Something that could be relevant to you. In a time of famine, God might speak to your heart and tell you, now I need you to go down there on Saturday and, and be down there with pastor and go down and evangelize. And you might be sitting there saying, that's an unlikely place. I need to be uh, at home dusting off my resume. I'm trying to get a job, and I don't have a job right now. I ain't got no time to be down there evangelizing. So in the natural, that may seem like a seemingly unlikely place, right? 
Well, I don't have time for that. But that's just the very thing that God will want you to do to bless you. Trying to get you in position. Amen. Remember, uh, they went to, are you all right there? What do you need? Oh, yes. Okay. I'll do that for you. All right. So anyway, a seemingly unlikely place could be a place that with the four lepers, it was, it was a place where their lives were being threatened. But for you, it might just be a place where you feel like that's not where I'm supposed to be. I got better. I got more important things to do. Or I, 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 just like, for example, here on Wednesday night. Now, for a lot of people in the church, this might be a seemingly unlikely place for you to be. Because you're like, well, I'm tired. I had a hard week and everything else. But I'm telling you, you get down here and hear this information, and it's life changing. It could, it could be a matter of life and death for you. It yes, could be sir. the very information that you need to hear yes, that will change your life around. Right. Now, so God will lead you to this place. And guess what? When you allow him to lead you, he'll reward you for following him. When you follow him to this seemingly unlikely place, when you get there, the reward is already waiting. Come on, somebody. Mm -hmm. When you get there, this, I like that message last week. When you get there, it's already, somebody say, laid out. Laid out. Can you believe that? I mean, the food was already laid out. The treasure was already laid out. And, and, and they took God so much that they went and buried the treasure and came back and then went into another tent. This was in the Syrian camp, right? So the four lepers, they, they went to the Syrian camp where they thought they could have been killed. They got there. They found all the food they needed in a time of dire famine. I mean, it was so bad that folk wanted to, to eat donkey heads and, and dove dung, right? This is how bad stuff was. But God led them right to it. So tonight, this is lesson number five, the last lesson in this particular division. And you can subtitle tonight's lesson, Good Understanding About Abundance. Good Understanding About Abundance. Now, point number one for tonight is, when God rewards our obedience with abundance, we must not be unmindful of the needs of others. When God rewards our obedience with abundance, we must not be unmindful of the needs of others in their place. In other words, when we follow God to a place, okay, we follow God to the place he wants us to be in. And like I just told you, when we get there, what did we find? Abundance. When we get there, what did we find? Everything is laid out. Well, when we get, that's what you call a reward. Now, somebody said reward. So now when we get there, we find this reward, and it's abundant. God does not want us to be unmindful of the people who are not yet there. Are y'all with me? Letter A says, our abundance is for our brother's lack. Say, my abundance is for my brother's lack. Yeah, and so here's what happens. Let's look at 2 Kings, chapter number 7. Uh we know that it's the story of the... Th so what we're doing is we're continuing with the story of the four lepers, right? So the four lepers are there at the Syrian camp. In other words, at the enemy camp. Y'all with me? Mm -hmm. But then they said to each other, 2 Kings chapter 7, verse 9. They said to each other, we shouldn't be doing this. Wait a minute. What do you mean you shouldn't be doing this? No, they, they're, they're hungry. They're eating. They, they don't have any money. They got some treasure. Seemed like God hooked them up. But what's the problem? The problem was, let's read on. They said, we shouldn't be doing this. We have good news. Ooh, that just hit me. We have good news. What's the definition of the gospel? Good news. Did anybody pick that up in the spirit? They said, we have good news. And we shouldn't keep it to ourselves. Boy, I like that. Somebody say, don't keep the good news, keep the good news. To, yourself. to yourself. Now, that's a really important point we just got, didn't we, Reverend? When you have good news, shame on you if you keep it to yourself. Just went to a really nice restaurant at a really nice price. You won't tell nobody else about it because you think that maybe they might start going there and the place start getting too crowded. And, and if you go one day, it wouldn't be enough room for you. Shame <laughs> on you. Shame on you if you... Shame on you if you have good news and you're trying to keep it to yourself. You just found out about a really good stock and you, you came up and got a really good dividend on it and 
you wouldn't share that information with anybody else in your church. Shame on you when you keep all the good news to yourself. Well, guess what? Shame on you when you keep the best news to yourself. What's the best good news? Jesus, that he is the Lord. What's the second best good news? That you can, you can get to know Jesus the Lord at Truth and Love Christian Church. Shame on you. If you if, listen, do you know why this place was packed out on Sunday? Because we didn't keep the good news to ourselves. Let's give God some praise. Amen. Why would we want to keep the good news to ourselves? We want to tell everybody about it, right? And, and including, first of all, the, the, the original soul food, and then, of course, the other soul food we had. We were, we were having dinner for everybody. Hey, we spread the word on that too, didn't we? Yes. We had more than enough, didn't we? Hospitality, didn't we have more than enough? Yes. Health ministry, didn't we have more than enough? Yes. So we, we, it, was, it was good for us to spread the good news. Amen. Am I right about it? He said, we shouldn't keep this to ourselves. If we wait until morning to tell it, we are sure to be punished. Now, this is interesting. They, they had a sense that God would not be happy with them if they kept this all to them. Are y'all with me tonight? They said, God is not going to be happy if we keep this all to ourselves. Let's go right now. In other words, oh, they not only said that, that they shouldn't keep it to themselves, they said, we shouldn't wait to tell. Now, that's another point. Don't keep it to yourself and then don't wait. You might say, well, I'll tell somebody about this. I'll tell them about my church, but, but not right now. But not right now. Somebody say, don't wait. They said, we will not wait until morning to tell. We are, if we wait until morning to tell it, we'll sure to be punished. Let's go right now and tell the king's officers. So they left the camp, the Syrian camp, and they went back to their own city, Samaria, and they called out to the guards at the gate. And they said, we went to the Syrian camp and didn't see or hear anybody. The horses and donkeys have been untied and the tents are just as the Syrians left them. And watch this. Verse 11 says, the guards announced the news and it was reported unto the palace. So the lepers didn't keep the news. They told it to the who? The guards. And what did the guards do? They didn't sit on that news either, did they? Right. They went and reported it to who? The to the king. There you go. To the palace. To the king. Church, once we find a place of safety, come on now, <laughs> victory, come on now, and true prosperity, what do we have to do? We have to hurry up and tell somebody. Turn your name. So you better tell somebody. Tell somebody. You have found. Listen. You, you like the four lepers. You found, you found an abundance and you found treasure and you found, uh, 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 every, you found a feast. You found everything that is needed. What are you going to do now? Hurry up and tell somebody. Listen, church. I want you to understand this. This is, this, this is some of the most important part in tonight's message. In troubled, tumultuous, tough times, God wants us to spread the good news. He wants us, listen, people are hurting out there. Are y'all getting this parallel? This is good stuff. People are hurting out there. The, the, the people in Samaria were about to die. People are dying out there. Are they dying out, the, out there in the streets? Yes. We can't sit on the good news. We got to go out there and we got to hurry up and what? Tell somebody. In other words, God wants us to help others in tough times. There it goes. If, you, if God shows you some good news, if you find out something good, and we found something good, haven't we, church? Mm -hmm. We found a good place. It's called truth and love. Amen? Amen. It's an oasis in a desert. Amen? Yeah. It's a light in a dark place. Amen? Amen. It, 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 it's, it's safety in, a, in, in troubled times. Amen? Yeah. It, it, it's a rock in a weary land. Amen. So we should run out there and try to help others. But now here is the big, big catch that God revealed to me. I'd never seen this before. And the Lord showed me this. And I said, oh, Nilly, look at this. Y'all want to hear it? Mm -hmm. Here's what the Lord said. He said, not only should you run out there and tell people the good news. 
of what you have found and how you got blessed. But he said to me that you need to uh, bring others into the house because you really don't know who God is going to use to help you. Mm. No, wait a minute. Now. Let me see if I can. Let me see if I can work with this. Okay. You need in tough times. You need to bring others into the house because you don't know who God. You don't know who God is going to use to be a blessing to you. Who the next person God is going to use to be a blessing to you. Amen. Now let me see if I can help you understand the way God said this to me. I've been hearing this story for years and years, but. It kind of hit me today. This story is about four what? Four lepers. Four lepers. Uh, the, the nationality, the ethnicity and nationality of the lepers is what? They're Jewish. How do we know they're Jewish? They're Jewish because two reasons. One, they were outside the city gates of the Jews, of Samaria. And two, when they got the knowledge of where all the booty was, where all the treasure and all the good stuff was, the, the bounty, then they said, God will punish us if we don't tell who? Our brothers, our, brothers, our countrymen. So we can, we can deduce then that, that they were Israelites, that they were Jews, that they were a, a part of that city. But then, but when the story starts, where are the lepers? Outside. The lepers are outside the city. Why are the lepers outside the city? Because they have a dreaded disease, and the people inside the city looked at them as outcasts. This thing hit me today. I was. It was like. It was like a. It was like a big punchline, like a ton of bricks. The people that saved the day were the outcasts. That's it. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm going to let you marinate on that for a second. The people that obeyed God and actually saved the whole race of people were the outcasts. The people who were the, the leftovers, the people who were the cast out, the people who were the outcast, the people that were not in the city because the people didn't want them in the city because they were afraid to sit next to them, afraid to touch them, afraid, you know, to, to, that they might catch something from them. Those are the folk who ended up saving the day. Let's give God some praise. Isn't that something? So in other words, in other words, you, you, you know, it, it, it reminds me of some of the people that I've met out in evangelism. And, and, and after I met them, I brought them into the city. Somebody say, this is the city. This is the city. Say, say our church, our church. Is, the is the city. In other words, Samaria is a type of our church, right, of truth and love. Now, I brought them into the city. And since they've been here in the city, seem like they've been helping me in every which way I can imagine. And I asked myself, what would have happened had I not gone out there and brought them into the city? I would have missed out on all their help because they were the ones, you know, the, 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 the Tyrone McKay's. They were the ones who are helping me build the city. You understand what I'm saying? But they weren't in the city. They were outside the city. And we had to go out there to get them. Now, now this, is, this should be a very strong incentive for you all to come out there and evangelize with me, street evangelize with me. I didn't say for me, I said with me. Because I go out there, Reverend goes out there, Minister King goes out there. It's this beautiful church where, the, where all the, the so-called licensed and ordained ministers will go out there. We're not just sending folk out there, we're leading you out there. Let's give God praise Amen. for that. Amen. We're not just saying, y'all go out there and y'all get them. So listen, I want you to know that, that, that God is saying that the help that we need in tough times, we need to go and bring into the city because we don't know who God will use to help us. Now, we said, letter A is our abundance is, our, is for our brother's lack. 
And letter B says, our brothers will have to walk by faith to resolve their lack. Our brothers will also have to walk by faith to resolve their lack. In other words, we know that faith is believing in and acting upon what God said in spite of what it looks like. Yeah. Well, the lepers went to the camp, to the Syrian camp, and when they got there, they saw that everything was good. And then they went and they told the news to their brothers back in the city, and the brothers had to do the same thing the lepers had to do. They had to walk by faith. They had to walk by obedience and go there and see for themselves. As long as they listened to the lepers, they could have said, well, uh, you said there's some food there. Great. You know, bring us up back. It was too much for them to bring back. They said, you have to come see for yourself. You got to come see for yourself. You know, it's, it's one thing for you to tell people about what's going on here, but at some point, if they're going to be people of faith and people of victory, they got to come see for themselves. Can I get an amen? amen? So our brothers will have to walk and do the same thing that we did. They'll have to walk by faith to resolve their lack. In other words, we're all going to have to do the same thing. You know, if, if, if let me turn that around another way. I've been telling you that I've gotten out there in the mission field and I met a, a brother Tyrone who's helped me. Well, guess what? There's a brother Tyrone who's out there for you. Somebody you might meet on the mission field, meaning somebody that you might evangelize, that person could be the missing link to something you needed to know. Just like tonight, I was talking with a young lady tonight, uh, and she does grant writing. And I'm sitting there going, wow, that's, a, that's an important piece to a puzzle yeah. for a local church. Do you see what I'm saying? You don't know who's out there. You don't know what they know, but you won't find out until you go out there and you take that walk of faith for yourself. Amen? Amen. So, 2 Kings chapter 7, verses 12 through 16. It basically tells you that it was still night, but the king got out of bed and he said to his officials, I'll tell you what the Syrians are planning. They know about the family here, so they have left their camp to go hide in the countryside. They think that we will leave the city to find food then they will take us alive and capture the city. In other words, when the leper, when the good news that the lepers shared with the guards and the guards shared with the king, when the king heard it, initially, he had what? Distrust. Mm -hmm. He said, like, I'm telling you to go out to, to evangelize on Saturday. He said, yeah, but I don't know. You know, they're saying that, but, but that, might not, that, that might be a setup. That, if I do that, uh, I'm going to miss the time that I need to be, you know, cleaning my house. I'm going to miss the time I need to be polishing off my resume. In other words, he, he looked at it with distrust and doubt. And then one of the officials in verse 13 said, uh, the people here in the city are doomed anyway. <laughs> I like that. He said, King, he's like, look, you think you're going to waste time by going out there. Maybe you get killed. He said, we're dying anyway. Right. Somebody say nothing from nothing. Nothing from nothing. Leaves nothing. Leaves nothing. In other words, look, he said, look, in other words, what do you have to lose? That's kind of what I'm saying. What do you have to lose? You've tried everything else. Well, I, I, I just don't know what I'm supposed to do. I don't know how to, how to network. I, I, I have, I'm trying to meet the right people. Well, maybe you need to do what God is telling you to do. Go to an unlikely place and do an unlikely thing at an unlikely time. Somebody say, just try it. Just try it. I mean, I'm telling you, and that is kind of like what the king was thinking. He was thinking, this is an unlikely place. This is an unlikely situation. I'm not going out there. It's a set up. They're going to kill us. You know, why am I going down there on Saturday and trying to evangelize these people? They're just going to waste my time. I could be doing something else. But the truth of the matter is, the most successful place to be is where? In the will of God. And then I can imagine the king saying, uh, Minister Ken, and plus that, why do I want to take the word of these lepers anyway? Uh, they don't know what they're talking about. It, this, is a, this is a trap. This has got to be a trap. So watch this. The official, somebody said, thank God for the official. He said, look, we're dying anyway, like those that have already died. So let's, let's oh, wait, here we go. Now, this is, this is good. He said, King, I know you are distrustful. We got a lot of distrustful Christians. I couldn't even get one amen on that up. We have a lot of distrustful Christians. Thank you for the amen. amen. 
And, and, and the king was like, I ain't going out there. But the, but the official was wise. I wish I knew who he was. I'm going to meet him one day. He was wise and he said, king, look, he said, I'm not telling you that you have to send your whole army down there. He said, just send some. Send a scouting uh, group down there and then you'll know. Listen, I'm not telling you you have to make a commitment to go and evangelize every Saturday. But just take one Saturday out of a month and check it out. Somebody say, try it. Try In other words, sit, sit, sit out a scouting party. Just you be the scouting party. You just go out there one time just to check it out. You didn't make a, 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 a life commitment to pastor, but just check it out. That's what they did. They said, okay, okay, we'll just check it out. Somebody said, check it out. Verse 14, so they chose some men and the king sent them in two chariots with instructions to go and to find out what happened to the Syrian army. The men went as far as Jordan and all along the road and all along the road they saw the clothes and equipment that the Syrians had abandoned as they fled. Oh! So they checked it out and right now they start to see that what the, what the lepers had said so far is what? True. Then they returned and reported it to the king. And the people of Samaria rushed out and looted the Syrian camp. And as the Lord had said, 10 pounds of the best wheat or 20 pounds of barley were sold for one piece of silver that day. In other words, it was just like what God said. It was just like what the leper said. It was just like what pastor said. You get out there. In fact, I'll give you another example. I went, uh, we went out evangelizing last uh, Saturday, right? And the young, there was a young lady that I met out there. And uh, let's see, who was out there with me? Sister G was out there, Giselle, yeah. and uh, Kat was out there. Well, Brother Cliff, remember when we were all standing together and there was this wife and husband, and we were kind of spending some time with them. That young lady came to church on Sunday, and that young lady's cousin is a co-worker of my daughter. Mm. Found out, found this out just sitting. Our daughters found this out just sitting around the table. My daughter said, "Dad, Dad, uh, I just found this out that uh, th th this young lady that I eat lunch with every day is a cousin of a lady that you met up there in the 99 cent parking lot." And she, because the lady was somebody that, when she was telling me what she did, I said, "Oh, well, what you do is like what my daughter does. You know, you're you're." basically uh, a psychologist, a social worker, and all of that. And so I hooked them up, and then they found out that they have common friends or whatever. That's a network. What I'm trying to tell you is that in these perilous times, listen to me very carefully, God has, he's trying to hook us up with the right people. It's not, it's not the money. It's the, it's the, it's the information and the connections. Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's not the money. It's the people. And it's the, it's the information. And when that gets connected to you, you have favor and then you're going to have success. Let's give God some praise. I'm telling you, when you get this. So, so I, I'm just like, I, I got this thing now. It's like, well, who am I going to meet tomorrow, Lord? It's amazing. I, it's, it's amazing. I didn't even tell my wife about this guy that I just met uh, at the grocery store. Kind of deep. Because every day, is, it's like I at least meet one person a day that God wants me to meet to advance the kingdom. At least one, sometimes several people a day. But this guy I met, and I was coming out the grocery store, and he, uh, now here's what's really weird about it. The more I do this, the bolder I get. I'm getting to a point where I just, it, it's just, it's, it's ridiculous. It's just ridiculous, guys. I mean, it's just, I mean, I'm telling you the truth, it's kind of ridiculous. I just, oh, I'm, now I just pull out, I just say, I just, so, usually in the past, I kind of wait for a connection, like, you know, you say something to somebody like, oh, sure, it's a hot day today, or, wow, the price of these oranges today, you know, some little icebreaker. Now, I just think a person, here, I just want to give you this card. That's it. Now, the guy I gave it to, he was like, oh, hey, praise God. You know, I, in fact, I think what happened was I heard him say something about, no, I just said, I said, hey, how you doing? God bless you or something. 
And he said, God bless you too. That was it. And I said, here, take this car. He is a, he is a minister of the gospel. And he does things in Japan. He's a black guy. And then he also does gospel brunch and stuff out here. But he just gave me his car. And I was like, I was thinking about Xavier and how she went to Japan. But I, you don't know what God trying to do. You don't know if he's trying to hook me up with a thing where I have a satellite TLC and see in Japan or something. You just don't know. But, but the man was right there. What you have to do is start thinking about, start being more observant of your surroundings because once you pray that God will have people across your path, you start looking. I'm serious. You start everywhere. I got, I'm just kind of like looking at. Is, is this the person? Is it turning? They say, "Are you the one?" Because <laughs> you might be. You know, hey, you might be the one. You might, I, I'm telling you, grocery line, cleaning line, barber shop, beauty shop, whatever. You know, brother, there, you got people coming in your seat several times a day. You got to be. Your antenna's got to be up. You got to be thinking now. You know, is, is what what does. You know, what does God want me to say to this person? What does God, what, what potential network or connection or hookup for the kingdom's sake is God have in store with this person? Yes. Real estate. You see people all the time, Brother Clyde. What potential connection is, is going on there? You understand what I'm saying? It's, ama it's an amazing thing. So, listen, let's continue on here. We said that uh, letter A is our abundance is for our brother's lack. Letter B is our brothers will have to walk by faith to resolve their lack. They're going to have to walk by faith just like they have to walk also by faith like we did to resolve their lack. In other words, the lepers, they believed God and they went and got theirs. But guess what? The king and the other people, they had to do the same thing. Don't you think for one minute that God's going to do something different that somebody, this, some other angle or some way they can go around what you had to do to get your abundance, it's the same thing. You had to come down to the place of safety, victory, and true prosperity, and the people who are wanting to get their spiritual greatness, spiritual abundance, and spiritual service, they got to do the same thing. They got to come on down here too. Can I get an amen? amen. And then lastly, those brothers, whoa, those brothers who had no faith in what God promised will experience lack and possibly death. Wow. Those brothers who had no faith in what God promised will experience lack and possibly death. Now this sounds like a very harsh word, but if it's in the Bible, it's there, it's there for a reason. There was an official when Elijah said that this thing was going to turn around. Remember that official? He said, that ain't going to happen. God can't do that. Even if God himself would come down there, that ain't going to happen. Mm -hmm. And, and Elijah, Elijah shut and said back to him, oh, it's going to happen, and you're going to see it, but you won't be able to eat it. In other words, translation, you're going to be struck dead. What am I telling you? I'm telling you that, that uh, when God speaks something, and it is to create abundance for his people, be careful. Don't put your mouth against it. That's right. See, are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. it, listen, look, look at 2 Kings chapter 7, verse 19. The officer had answered. Remember the officer said, that can't happen. Not even if the Lord himself were to send grain at once. You know, that's irreverent. Talk, t talking like that. Be careful how you talk about God. Mm -hmm. Man, God, he, not even, you know, I'm noticing that in the times we live in, people are just throwing the name Jesus around. Yeah, and Jesus said, well, where was that? Somebody said, uh, I just recently I heard somebody saying that. Well, uh, even if Jesus was trying to sell that, he couldn't make a sale out of that or something like that. Be careful. Be careful how you use the name. That's a commandment. Thou shalt not use the Lord's name in vain. Amen, somebody? Amen. He said, even if the Lord himself were to sell grain, it wasn't good enough. And Elijah replied, you will see it, but you won't be able to eat the food. And that is just what happened, it says in verse 20. He died trampled to death by the people at the city gate. Did you see that? Church, I want you to understand something tonight. The Bible says that death and life are in the power of the what? And I'm here to tell you tonight, I stopped by to tell you tonight that we don't want to be on the wrong side of that power. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. 
Your tongue can speak life or your tongue can speak death and you don't want to be on the wrong side of that power. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Listen, we don't want to be those who speak against what God is doing. When God is saying it's time for Operation Full House, you need to say yay and amen. And not be talking about, well, even if God didn't say, well, I, pastor don't know what he's talking about. If God would have come down and passed flies out at themselves, I ain't going to be filled up. You need to watch it. You need to watch it. The people are going to trample over you. You, better, you need to watch it, church. I'm just, I'm trying to be honest, whether this is for somebody here or for somebody on tape, somebody online. I'm trying to tell you that when God, because look at what happens when God is speaking abundance. It involves us, but it's really not about us. It's so much bigger than us. We had people in here on Sunday, and this thing was about God's people. And when God is in something like that, we better get out of the way and let the thing, let go and let God. Amen, somebody? We better let that thing go because God has a plan, God has a purpose, and God has a provision. And if we're not a part of it, we need to just be quiet and get out of the way, but let not be, uh, put our uh, miles against it because who knows if we, like he told Paul he said, Paul, it is not good for you to kick against the pricks. In other words don't you kick where, don't you push back against where I'm pushing forward. Don't you push back where in the direction that I'm pushing forward. You better watch it because you fight. your arms are too short to fox, to fight and box with God. Let's give God some praise, church. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. God will bless faith. But he curses unbelief. And he especially does not want us poisoning the well for other potential believers. See, we have, we have a tendency to think that when we say something, you know, well, that's just my opinion. Then nobody asks you for your opinion, really, to be honest with you. And, and particularly when it comes against the knowledge and the will of God, we have to be careful. Because what he's talking about, God is interested in souls. Do you all understand what I'm saying? I mean, we have food here and stuff, but that was what God is interested in souls. Somebody say soul winning. So he, it doesn't matter what we, you know, we can have some food and next time we can have some music and one time we might have some jazz. And, but the truth of the matter is he's not really interested in that. He's interested in souls because the Bible says, listen to this church, there's only one place in the Bible where it says that all of heaven rejoices. When is that? When one soul comes into a repentance and salvation in Christ. Am I right about that? So let's give God some praise. Let's put our mouth where his mouth is and anything else, let's stay out of the way. All right. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, saints are praying.